college and high school athletes, if you go all the way down to, to kids and I guess teens, but all the way down to children as well, talking about creatine, obviously the, the pretty much the most studied supplement. We know it's got a tremendous uh, safety profile and the physiological performance benefits are, are well documented. What about for, for kids, whether it's for cognitive development, whether it's, you know, prophylactic use for, for head trauma, which we know in certain sports exposures at young ages is, is not a good thing. Can you talk about what the evidence shows us at the moment there? Yeah, um, that, that's, that's been a topic that uh, Dr. Andrew Jagob and I have tried to summarize very fairly, but also uh, continue to, to put some, so what we feel are kind of some of the better documents out there for people to, to, to go to um, in, in this perspective. So I think, you know, you're, if we just kind of go backwards, I mean, you're, you know, your, your comment is, is a hundred percent on point in terms of creatine, creatine monohydrate being the most commonly studied version of creatine. Um, you know, it goes back to the, the, you know, the early nineties, there's literally thoughts. So I always, I always have to do this with creatine because there's still mm -hmm. people out there that think that it's not studied, that think that it's not, that it doesn't work. I mean, there's, there's, we're, we're there's literally, there's, you know, approaching thousands of studies on creatine and exercise. It's been studied since since 1992. There's no less than 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 like 10 like well controlled randomized double blind placebo controlled studies that have just looked at safety, just looked at safety. And, wow. and you know, so there's there's multiple studies that are out there. So honestly, somebody who's saying those those things that they either have a bias that's not allowing them to accept it, or they just don't know the literature. It's one of those two things. Now, you you mentioned kind of some of the clinical applications. There was actually my um, so my former PhD mentor Rick Kreider, who's the director of the program at Texas A and M, has been a has been a world leader in in um, you know creatine research. He was doing creatine research when I was at my when I did my master's degree with him at the University of Memphis, and still to date, some of his studies with the football teams and baseball teams that were at Arkansas State. Are some of the longest papers that have ever been done with creatine. That's 27 month studies wow. done uh, on the football team. You know, one of the things that I like to share with people that that study would have been longer if the NCAA did not rule in 2000 and when whatever that universities could no longer provide creatine to their athletes. That's why yeah. that study stopped. That study stopped because of, because of that ruling. So there would be, so we, we actually, we like to point that out, that there would be even longer data in creatine and athletes had um, the, NCAA, the NCAA not made that ruling. Wow. But that's a little bit beside the point. You know, so there's there's a lot of literature uh, surrounding creatine. Now, creatine and kids or adolescents, you know, and maybe we're, so I think to kind of frame that, in my mind, we're, we're talking about high school age athletes, you know, 13 to 18 year olds or so. Mm -hmm. um, so I think number one, you know, there's, there's been a, a, an extremely limited amount of research done in North America on creatine and adolescence. Rick Kreider and um, Pamela Grindstaff did a study with some like junior adolescent swimmers. And that was honestly one of the first papers that had, that had been done. The majority of the work has been done in um, uh, higher level soccer athletes in South America. So there's been a number of efficacy studies looking at improvements in performance and things along those lines. And, and we generally see very similar outcomes in those aged athletes as we would see in kind of adult athletes, if you will. From a, from a pure safety perspective, and this still kind of continues to baffle Dr. Jagam and I, there are zero randomized controlled, placebo controlled studies that with the, the sole intent purpose of doing a safety profile on supplementation in adolescents with creatine. And I always try to be transparent and basically going to open it up front. So like, so for a parent, that's skeptical, they could say, well, until there's any safety data, then we're not, I know my kid's not using it. And I totally get it. But that being said, they also do need to understand that there, there are 10, 15 studies that are in the published literature that have supplemented with creatine with adolescent athletes. And there's been no pattern of documented adverse events associated with the supplementation. So there's evidence. It's just, there hasn't been a single study, you know, a study that has been developed with the sole and intent purpose of, of, looking at the safety question. They've basically, they've done efficacy and not monitored safety around it. And there's been nothing safety wise to report. I personally don't think that there's, there's any concerns for a younger athlete to use creatine, but, but that message is not, it is certainly intended only for those athletes that don't have any type of a prior medical history. We actually have a grant submitted right now to the NSCA foundation to, to do that study. 
It's a really important question because when we look at the usage rates, I mean, it's about 5% when kids go into high school in the ninth grade. And by the time we're in the 12th yep. grade, it's about 22, 25%. And when I think of the sports where, you know, setting aside even the performance benefits, if we look at sort of obviously mental health and head traumas become front and center and, you know, being from Canada, ice hockey is the number one sport. Yep. You, you get a 13 year old who's 200 pounds and a same 13 year old who's 150 and they're allowed to, 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 to body check. Or if you have a similar thing in football, you know, from a prophylactic standpoint, this seems like it would be something that, especially for kids, when it becomes really important to support the brain. I know, you know, the research there is in its infancy as in relation to adults, let alone kids, but just curious your thoughts on, on that side of things in terms of actually being able to potentially help support and protect the brain. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that will be one of the more important questions for creatine and sports within the next 10 years. Uh, Rick Kreider has, has spoken about that a handful of times because uh, there is a gr growing database of, of, of literature in various populations to suggest that creatine does function in a um, you know, like a neuroprotective type of a type of a situation. But in forms of controlled evidence, gotten after some of those outcomes, I don't really think we have much in the literature at this point in time. And and again, it becomes extremely challenging to do those studies. Uh, but those those studies are critically needed. I think there's there's a tremendous amount of potential for creatine in that space. I think you could also kind of throw fish oils into that discussion as well too. Mm -hmm. uh, the potential combination of them because they function entirely different mechanistically is even more exciting. Just jumping back really quickly with with creatine and kids, yeah. Because I, I I don't want I just don't want to leave this hanging because I definitely don't. I was I was trying to be cautious. I don't want people that have never heard me before. I don't I don't want them to think that that I'm just pushing creatine on kids, you know. Because I think in general our our approach with it is that if you've got a young individual, you know, let's just say freshman or sophomore, who's just getting into training, I would go back to what we talked about within the first 10 minutes of our conversation. And that is that that athlete needs to focus on the foundations. Mm -hmm. They need to develop a great habit or pattern of training, training consistently, training hard, get some fundamental aspects of their diet in order. And then once that athlete has proven the maturity and the ability to do that, then we can start talking about this conversation of adding in a dietary supplement, you know, such as, you know, such as creatine. I think, you know, things like protein and carbohydrates, that's just good nutrition like that. Mm -hmm. I don't, that's a completely separate discussion, you know, and that, and, and I mean, that's the advice that I'm going to give to my own children. That's the advice that I give to my friend's children, because I just think that it focuses everybody in on what's the most important thing. And that is that they've, you've got you've got to train, you've got to train consistently, and then you've got to fuel the body appropriately. Uh, you know, those young bodies, they've, they have so much potential to just adapt and grow on their own.